Welcome to the 28th Undergraduate Communication Research Conference at the University of St. Thomas. I think the most important part of that phrase is 28. Uh, we have been doing this for a long time and we're very proud of the work that we're doing. My name is Dr. Kevin Sauter and I'm a faculty member here in the Communication and Journalism Department and um, uh, I'm the director, co-director of the conference this year. Uh, my colleagues and I spread it around. We each do a couple of years and then we pass it on to the next person. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be doing uh, the hosting duties today. We will be hearing from Dr. Mark Meisner in a little bit, but we have a few uh, business items that we need to take care of first. And of course, the most important is that uh, we want to say thank you to some people. And we'll start by simply thanking the uh, the people in catering and serving for doing this wonderful spread. The, the food is terrific. I'm sure they heard you back in the, in the lunchroom. Um, there are, of course, many people who have contributed to the success of this particular conference. And um, uh, many of them are faculty members. Uh, I'm sure that the students are at least somewhat aware when they submit their papers that several uh, pairs of eyes get to see your paper more than probably have ever looked at the papers that you've written before. Uh, that at first submission we have a panel of faculty members who review your papers to ensure that they are of sufficient quality to be admitted to the conference. And we're pleased that, of course, all of yours were seen as meeting that bar of, uh, of admission. So we're very pleased with that. The group that did that reviewing included uh, Professor Bernard Armada, Dr. Deborah Peterson, Professor Peter Gregg, Michael O'Donnell, and uh, those are all my colleagues from the Communication and Journalism Department here at St. Thomas. And we also had two uh, of our colleagues from Minnesota State University at Mankato, uh, Dr. Emily Sauter and her colleague Justin Rudnick. So I think those folks should get a nice round of applause for the work they did. There's also administrative support that comes with this. This is a, a conference that takes uh, financial support and allowing us facilities and money and printing and a lot of other things that go into the success of the conference. And um, I want to uh, identify two individuals particularly who are important to the success of this conference. First is Dr. Bruce Gleason, who is the chair of the Communication and Journalism Department. Uh, Bruce is right here. Thank you, Bruce. And um, we have with us a representative of the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences office, Dr. Yohura Williams, who was our dean, was unable to attend, but the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, Dr. Jaina Diddy, is here, and we want to thank her for the dean's support. Where are you, Jaina? I know you're around. There you are. Wave your hand, Jaina, so we know who you are. Thank you. Um, one other item of business is uh, there's a drawing, and I don't know if you got the, as you checked in, if you heard that there's a raffle. Uh, so we would encourage all of you to sign in, get your name on the raffle ticket. You can do that at the front desk. Um, and I believe there's some wireless headphones and some really, a uh, couple of nice prizes. So uh, those will be given out at the end of the conference after the third uh, session. So come back after your session and we'll have that drawing for those, those prizes. One of the real honors that I have uh, as the co-director um, is uh, to thank my co-director, the person who is really responsible for the vast majority of all of this. Uh, she is the, uh, the coordinator of our office in the Communication and Journalism Department, and you all have had correspondence with her, but well beyond the correspondence is all the work that she does to coordinate and organize and help host and run the registration and uh, order the food and the, the tech work and everything else. And so I want to say particular thanks to uh, Oyuna Urantiameg for all of the work that she does every year on this project. Is she in the room? There she is, thank you. And she's just such a joy to work with, I will tell you. 
Um, now I'd like to move to the next part of our program, which is the top paper awards. Um, each of you submitted papers and they were read by those reviewers. But then we selected each of those reviewers would then nominate uh, papers for the top paper award. And uh, out of the, all of the submissions, I believe we had about 14 that were then nominated for the top paper award and were again read by faculty members uh, and they then rank those and we ended up with our, our top papers. So that's a, a real uh, honor for these people to, uh, the people who have won, to be recognized for the, the work that they've done. Um, and so it's my pleasure to announce the winners of the, uh, of the top paper awards at this year's conference. Uh, we have plaques that they can put on their wall and keep forever. Um, so if they would, uh, as I announce your name, come on up. We'll take a picture with your, uh, with your uh, academic supervisor um, and we'll give you your plaque. So the first is uh, Maya Shelton Davies from the University of St. Thomas. Um, Maya's uh, paper was Comedy and Controversy, How the Framing of Samantha Bee's Comments Against Ivanka Trunk and Calls to Apologize Illustrate the Challenges Facing Women in Comedy Today. And her faculty advisor, also the person handing out the plaques, Dr. Deborah Peterson. Congratulations, Maya. Um, I would like, the second one is by Kaysen Ellinger from the College of St. Benedict, St. John's University, whose uh, paper was titled, Changes, Tupac Shakur and the Rhetoric of Collective Memory. Um, faculty advisor was Eric Putnam. So, um, Kaysen, would you come up? There you are. <laughs> Eric is not here, is he? Doctor, is Dr. Putnam here? Oh, there he is. I didn't even see you. <laughs> yep, uh, there we go. Congratulations. Our third winner is uh, Jack Curlin from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, whose paper is Taking a Stand by Kneeling, a visual critique of Colin Kaepernick's protest during the national anthem. And his faculty advisor is Emily Winderman. Congratulations. And our final winner is uh, Alma Silver from St. Catherine University. Uh, whose paper is Why Media Outlets Frame Stephen Hawking's Death as Liberation, Analyzing Representations of the Disability Community Within Mass Communication, and her faculty advisor, Dr. Deborah Peterson. All right, congratulations. Way to go, Alma. I must note for the record that uh, Alma is a student at St. Catharines, but she took her class at St. Thomas, so, you know. <laughs> Just saying is all. And now I get to um, have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker. You know, I think back on the days when I was a uh, uh, a beginning graduate student. I remember my first uh, a conference that I went to was as a master's student, so I was only three months removed from my undergraduate days, and I went to Chicago to the Palmer House Hotel for the National Communication Association conference or convention. And I remember being there and seeing people walking through the lobby, and one of my friends says, Psst, that's Carol Arnold. Now, you may not know the name Carol Arnold, but he was one of the lions of the field, one of the early members of the communication discipline that helped to grow the field into what it is today. And it was kind of fun for me to see 
that uh, somebody that I had been reading uh, in my undergraduate classes, and to see this this uh, person who was such an icon of the field, and he was real then, but he was kind of a celebrity for a week. You know, it was pretty cool. Um, but it says something about the history of the field as I look back 45 years ago to my brush with Carol Arnold, whom I then went and studied with at uh, Penn State University, uh, and he was he was a treasure. Um, history is important, and the development of the discipline is important, and the development of this conference, I think, is important because it, it gives us a sense of who we are as an academic identity, that we are scholars of communication. And we started this, uh, this conference 28 years ago with uh, the goal of trying to highlight the work that our students are doing. And we have since uh, invited many other people to come, and they have come from far and wide. As you look through the program today, you probably notice that we have some people that are from around town, the University of Minnesota, from Augsburg, from Hamlin, from St. Kate's, et cetera. But we also have people that came down from Crookston, and we have people that drove down from Morris. They told me from Morris they had to leave at about 5 o'clock this morning in order to get here. Uh, we have one student who has come from Tennessee. Where is our Tennessean? Yay. And we also have a group that uh, drove from Indiana, and I want to recognize that group. They are also here. There you are. Do you have to leave and drive back right after this? Well, good luck. <laughs> But I think it says something about the history and the breadth of the field that we're bringing these scholars together, you all together, to talk about um, the, the research that you have done and the things that interest you. I would also point out in the program a list of names that perhaps you passed by as you were browsing looking for a session to go to, the past keynote speakers. And we entered this into the program last year because we wanted people to have a sense for the legacy of this uh, conference. It started um, in 1992 with James Chesbro, and I was the director of the first uh, conference back then, and I thought, well, let's go for the biggest name we can, really, and uh, Dr. Chesbro was the, the director of the National Communication Association at the time, and he readily agreed to come and be the keynote speaker at our first conference. I thought, wow, we can get good people to come to this. And if you look through this list, um, some of these names you, I'm sure, don't know, but I would suspect along the way that there are names of, of scholars that you may have read an article or used their book in your class. Uh, I look at the number third one here, Bonnie Dow, and just yesterday in my television criticism class, we were discussing an article that she wrote that we were reading in our class. And we have some of the, the real... Um, uh, highlights of the field, some of the great scholars in our field that are here. Some are in interpersonal communication. We have some that are in intercultural communication. We have rhetoric uh, scholars that are represented here. We have media people who have come and acted as our, as our speaker. But until this year, we have never had anybody come and talk to us about environmental communication. And so we are particularly pleased this year to have uh, uh, Dr. Meisner join us to open our eyes to yet another dimension of the very wide uh, communication discipline. As I was looking online, because that's what you do, uh, for Dr. Meisner's uh, bio, um, there was this. Dr. Meisner has experience as a teacher, editor, information technology consultant, media analyst, and administrator of cultural programs. His areas of expertise include environmental communication, information technology, media, climate change, global warming, sustainability, environmental ethics, and environmental affairs generally. He holds a Bachelor of Commerce with honors from Queen's University at Kingston, as well as master's and PhD degrees in environmental studies from York University in Toronto. He is a teacher. He teaches online classes from the organization that he heads, the International Environmental Communication Association. He has taught at the State University of New York in the College of Environmental, um, and, uh, Environmental Science and Forestry. He has also taught at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, 
I said that wrong, I'm sure, Royal Rhodes University and at McMaster University. As a scholar, he has many different interests and he has done work in Peru. He has done things on media narratives about it, environment um, and he has talked about and studied environmental activists. He is also a speaker where he has given talks at uh, science conferences. He has spoken in Montreal and in Helsinki and Chicago. He was a part of the Fleming College Environmental Visual Communication Program at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, and he has also spoken, of course, in Puerto Rico. So we have a person here who is going to be added to our list of distinguished speakers at the Undergraduate Research Conference here at St. Thomas, and I'm sure he's going to uh, open our eyes, as I said, to the power of communication when it comes to issues of in the environment. So let me introduce and give him a warm welcome, Dr. Mark Meisner. Hi, everybody. So I'm just going to make sure I get this uh, PowerPoint uh, going here. And let me switch that over. Yes, OK. Can everybody hear me OK? All right. Thank you, uh, Kevin, for that very kind, generous uh, introduction. Uh, I, what can I say? It's such an honor for me to be here and included in that list that, that he was mentioning. I also want to thank uh, Deborah Peterson, who uh, invited me and who has organized my visit, uh, along with uh, Mark Newsel. I don't know if Mark is here today or not, um, and Oyuna, of course, for all of the logistical help. Um, and thank you all for coming, and, and uh, thanks for, uh, for taking the time to, to hear what I have to say. So. Um, I'm going to be talking about environmental communication today, but I just want to make it clear that I'm going to be focusing not so much on the day-to-day -day kinds of communication issues that we deal with in environmental communication, so how to design you know, effective campaigns and that sort of thing. I'm, I'm really talking about a long-term uh, cultural change uh, dimension of communication. So um, I'll be focusing on some of the ways that we can help or how communication can help us make the transition to uh, cultures of sustainability. Um, this is a decades-long uh, project, so uh, we're really, you know the interest is that we, we find ways to sort of uphold uh, social justice, ecological health, environmental justice, and, and other dimensions of sustainability. So after a few, uh, just uh, some more introductory thoughts, I'm going to talk about a couple of the cultural problems that we face uh, that underlie environmental issues. Um, and then I'm going to get into talking about three different facets of communication that connect to each other and that I think will help us uh, make that transition to those cultures of sustainability that I was talking about. And those three facets are um, ecologically inclusive language, uh, compassionate values, and positive stories. Okay, so when I started studying environmental communication um, in the late 80s, I guess it was, there really wasn't much written about it and it certainly wasn't defined as a scholarly field at that time. There were a few people in rhetoric working in it and some work in uh, journalism looking at um, uh, journalists and media coverage of environmental issues. So I've really uh, had the, the, the pleasure of spending my whole career watching this field grow and being part of the growth of the field. And um, though I do some scholarship, I also um, have, have spent a lot of my effort on uh, building the field from a kind of inst sort of helping to institutionalize it, um, in particular with this association, uh, but also prior to that. Um, so um, it's, you know, it's forming its identity and it, uh, you know, most of you probably haven't heard of environmental communication, but well, now you have. And, um, you know, we have a couple of journals and a couple of other journals that feed into the field and we have a professional association and uh, it's coming along. It's still got a long way to go. Um, I think that the field has a lot to offer and our potential is uh, yet to be realized. Okay, so um, uh, you've got a handout on the table there you, you can take away, which is something I wrote to try and kind of encapsulate for people who had no idea what environmental communication is. Uh, so you, you can look at that. But I'm, I'm going to sort of 
take from that, a, a definition here. Um, the first thing to know, uh, like other fields in communication, there's the practice and then there's the scholarship, uh, so the two halves of it. Um, so, um, so in its simpler, simplest terms, environmental communication is just communication about environmental affairs, and that includes, you know, interpersonal and organizational and mass mediated and so forth. Um, that uh, where we're talking about uh, environmental issues, problems, solutions, um, and also our relationship to nature and how we understand our connection to the planet. So that's uh, that that refers to the practice of it, um, and that's what environmentalists do, and that's what. Also, people who are opposed to environmental uh, progress do. It's all part of environmental communication. Um, so in terms of the field of study, um, it's, it's interdisciplinary. It draws on uh, a, a number of uh, disciplines, including, well, communication, of course, is interdisciplinary anyway, but it draws on psychology and political science. It draws on sociology and, and others to sort of inform the, the, the research. Um, but yeah, so the, the field basically studies the activity. Um, now, um, one of the things that environmental communication um, tries to do also is identify good practices because people are working in this field because, not simply because it's an interesting intellectual exercise, but because uh, they care about the state of the planet and, and what's happening to people and, and other species. And so working in this area, it, it's thought of as a kind of crisis discipline, um, the way conservation biology is. It's, it's got a, a strong value uh, orientation. So, um, okay, so um, as I said, the field has grown uh, immensely. The, the, the research has, has exploded uh, over the past 30 years, and we've, we have gained a lot of insights into those good practices. Um, however, um, there's, a, there's a gap whereby the practitioners have not really been um, up, kept up to speed uh, on the good practices. And so we get um, bad ideas being put into action when it comes to the practice of environmental communication. Um, just it, to use an analogy, I would say it's, it's as if the doctors didn't bother to read the medical journals. Um, we wouldn't have very good medicine. And, and that's the, un, unfortunately the sad state of affairs and, and one of the reasons we created the association because we wanted to. Uh, to try to, to remedy that. So um, we can also say that environmental communicators have been working in the modern environmental movement since the 1960s. And although there have been some successes, there have been more failures and, and overall things are getting worse. And so to me, that's a failure of communication. And I think that's another sign that we need to do better. So. Um, so in the short to medium term, environmental communicators urgently need to find better ways to communicate. And, and um, one of the sort of missions of, of our organization is to bring them together. So as a professional association, we, we're not just an academic association. We have practitioners in there and we have artists and, and others and lots of students. Um, so before I get into that, I just want to say a little bit about our ideas of nature and how these kind of uh, relate to that. Now, have any of you heard of this guy, Aldo Leopold? Anybody at all? Yep, a couple of people. Okay, so Aldo Leopold was an American uh, writer who worked for the U.S. Forest Service in the first half of the 20th century, and he has the distinction of having written a book, this, this book, A Sand County Almanac, excuse me, um, which is really a seminal work in American literature looking at our relationship to the natural world. Um, the book was published in 1949, posthumously after his death. And it was a series of essays that he'd written over time. Um, the one in particular that a lot of uh, environmental thinkers cite is called The Land Ethic. Um, but I'm gonna mention today another one um, called Thinking Like a Mountain. And you may, if you've been paying attention, you'll notice the similarity to the title of this talk. So that's why I'm talking about Aldo Leopold. So Thinking Like a Mountain, uh, scholars think was published in, or not published, but was written in uh, around 1909. And in that essay, um, Leopold tells the story of how he and a group of buddies shot up uh, a family of wolves just for the hell of it. 
Um, after the massacre, he looked into the eyes of one of those wolves as it was dying, and he recognized the significance of what he had done. To quote him, we reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. And so from that experience, he discerned a central lesson about the natural world and humanity's place in it. And it's encapsulated by this line from the essay. Only the mountain has lived long enough to listen objectively to the howl of a wolf. And from that derives his idea of thinking like a mountain. But what does that mean? It, you know, first of all, it means, well, humans need to be less arrogant and more humble towards the rest of the natural world. We need to stop thinking and acting like we know everything and we're in charge. That's a sort of simple way to put it. But in the case of the wolves in the mountain, Leopold explains how mountains need wolves to help keep the deer from becoming too abundant and thus eating all the plants that grow on the side of the mountain. So that's something the mountain doesn't want to happen. And it's a, it's a basic lesson of ecology and, and balance in ecosystems. Okay, so how can a mountain think? It's inanimate, right? Doesn't make sense. But this is where, you know, we call for a little bit of imagination. So imagine that you're a mountain and your lifespan isn't decades like a human lifespan, it's millions of years. Imagine what you would have seen and learned about life in that time. You'd have an immensely superior understanding of the world than humans do. You'd have a lot more wisdom. You'd understand at the deepest level the interconnectedness between all things. And you'd certainly understand the ecosystem relationships between deer, wolves, plant communities, and the mountain. So thinking like a mountain, so thinking like a mountain means having a deep identification with the natural world, appreciation for it, humility, um, it means having a, a consciousness and a field of care, if you will, is, is one way to put it, that goes beyond your skin encapsulated self. So it means you identify not just with your family and your friends, not just with your community or with the human species, but beyond that to identify with all life and, and the earth itself. So it's a, a, a field of, of moral care and concern is, is, is part of what ecological consciousness means. Um, so since Leopold, there's been quite a lot of work done in this area of environmental thought and philosophy and, and history and so forth to try to understand those cultural, uh, cultural roots. And again, this is very interdisciplinary. Anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, philosophers, et cetera, have worked on this. So now I want to talk about just a couple of the cultural problems that underlie those environmental issues. Um, and those are anthropocentrism and consumerism. So anthropocentrism, it's a widespread and problematic form of prejudice based on the belief that humans are superior to everything else in existence. To quote the Australian writer and activist John Seed, anthropocentrism or homocentrism means human chauvinism. Similar to sexism, but substitute human race for man and all other species for woman. Human chauvinism, the idea that humans are the crown of creation, the source of all value, the measure of all things, is deeply embedded in our culture and consciousness. What's that you're thinking? But we are superior, right? Well, let me ask you this. By what measure are we superior? Is it the ability to fly to outer space? Is it symphonies, poetry? What's your measure? Um, those are all good things, and they're all nice things that we do for ourselves, but they're no way to measure the value of another species, because obviously other species have their own things that they can do. So if I said, well, we're gonna measure all life by the ability to photosynthesize sunlight. Which species is best at photosynthesizing sunlight? Ah, uh, where would that put us? Well, below the dandelions anyway, <laughs> right? So how you value uh, yourself and how you value others depends on the measuring stick you use. 
So, you know, that's illustration. So, um, the game's rigged when we say we're superior. Um, now, it's really no different in, uh, let me put it this way. It's, it's technically the same as racists um, saying, you know, you're not white, so therefore you're inferior because white is the gold standard of skin color, right? Similar with sexism. The same for any kind of bigotry. It takes the other and it measures them against the self, using the self as the criteria and finds them wanting. So, um, so I know this is, it's a little hard for some people to get. It's like, because we do have this deeply embedded anthropocentrism that sees ourselves as, as special and separate and above other species. Um, okay, so there's another dimension of this that, um, that is really important that I'm just going to mention briefly. And it's that anthropocentrism regards those other species and the rest of the world not only as inferior and separate from us, but primarily as resources for our use for our consumption. And there's a word for this, and it's called resourcism. So to quote the, the environmental philosopher John Livingston, resourcism sees the non-human world, which is all external to humans and their structures, as raw material dedicated without reservation to the human purpose. The moment a human use is perceived in anything, that thing becomes a resource. And Leopold uh, made a similar point about this with respect to land. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. Okay, the second cultural problem that I want to talk about is consumerism. And this is certainly one that you're going to be more familiar with, uh, certainly at least aware of. Uh, we're, all, uh, we're all swimming in, in this uh, ocean here. Um, it's both an ideology and a system that support and reinforce each other. So as an ideology, consumerism means never-ending desire and regards the consumption of products and services as the means to happiness and well-being. It promotes the view that more is better, newer is better. We have the freedom to choose what to buy, and buying more and newer things will make us happy. Um, this kind of consumption is considered good for the economy and therefore good for the country. But as a system, consumerism drives an economy based on an ever-rising ever -rising levels of extraction, manufacturing, use, obsolescence, and waste. And the system pushes us to work more so we can consume more. It leaves us with excessive debt, not to mention emotional distress. And ironically, it often leaves us feeling empty. We get a little buzz when we buy something, but it doesn't last. So unhappy and unsatisfied and in debt is... Uh, a common symptom of consumerism. Um, and that burden of debt and burden of possessions takes away our freedom and often leaves us with a sense of meaninglessness in life. It also disengages us from civic life. So consumerism also sustains itself through popular culture because it normalizes these lifestyles and largely conceals the plunder and waste that come from them. Uh, from our consciousness. So what we need to put in place of consumerism, again, working towards that culture of sustainability, is a closed loop economic system supported by a culture of sufficiency. Um, and maybe that's not the best word, but it's the one that's kind of being used right now. Um, so by closed loop system, uh, I mean the reuse of materials such that nothing is ever wasted or dumped. And by sufficiency, I mean living well with much less stuff and using less energy. So I don't know about you, but I would like to live in a world where nothing's wasted, there's no poverty or pollution, our lives are not cluttered and weighed down with excessive stuff, and our communities are healthy. I think we'd be happier. So... As I've suggested, in the short to medium term, ethical pro-environmental communication urgently needs to find much more effective ways to persuade people, governments, companies, and other organizations to act to protect the earth. We've created the threats. We need to deal with them. Now, this is a pragmatic task of communication. It's the getting things done function. 
people who are also people who are paying attention to that and to what's going on with environmental issues, they understand this need, this need for better communication to create better policies and behavior change and so forth. However, however, I don't think that those same, let's say, woke people on the environmental front really understand the importance of the cultural problems that underlie them. And for example, the ones I've just discussed. So it sounds bold, I know, but I, I think we effectively need to, to replace those ways of being with cultures of respect for the earth and of each other, of social and environmental justice, and of material sufficiency, among other things. So for short, let's call these cultures of sustainability, though I acknowledge that that term is actually quite contested. Um, and so this brings us to the second function of uh, environmental communication. Um, now, of course, communication is not the only way that cultures change and emerge. It's not the only factor, but it's a pretty central one, a pretty important one. And that's what I'm here to talk about. And so the second function is, is um, the meaning-making function of communication, the constitutive function, to use the, the technical term. So my argument in this talk is that in order to make the transition to cultures of sustainability, our communication needs to cultivate the kinds of values and perceptions of the world and ourselves that will support such cultures in the long run. Again, we're talking about a decades-long project here. This is technically known, again, as I said, as the constitutive task. So this brings us now to the role of communication specifically and what I call talking like a mountain. So in simple terms, what I mean by talking like a mountain is this. Communication that supports long-term ecological health and social justice that, um, through the use of ecologically inclusive language, the strengthening of compassionate values, and the telling of positive stories. Now, just an aside here, this is kind of a first draft. It's the first time I've kind of tried to articulate what this, um, you know, what this might mean, what kind of long-term meaning-making needs to happen on this front. So there's probably other elements of this. Um, so those three facets of communication are the ones that I'm going to discuss today. And um, before I get to those, uh, I want to just say a little bit more about what I mean by talking like a mountain and what, what that might involve. So it has those three components, but, but I also think it's important to understand a couple of other uh, dimensions. It's a long-term project, uh, as I've said, with the goal of changing culture. No problem, right? Um, therefore, in my view, it requires organization and money. And there are examples of well-organized uh, networks, well-funded networks, shifting cultural values. I'm not going to get into those, but let's just say, for example, the perception of government in the United States. So talking like mountains is going to mean reflecting also a much more holistic view of environmental issues and problems. We need to help people understand how the issues are connected to each other and to the common problems that underlie them. Too much environmental discourse considers it, the environmental issues in isolation from each other, and those fragmented conversations about the issues don't really help us address the underlying problems. We're talking about symptom this and symptom that, but we're not really talking about the pathology. Um, and that can lead to unintended consequences. If you misdiagnose the problem or you don't even try to treat it, you may end up in a place you didn't expect. Um, so one example in contemporary environmental discourse uh, that I think is, uh, illustrates this is how we talk about climate change and the solutions to climate change or global warming or climate disruption or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that is uh, that we simply need to uh, transition to clean energy, right? Renewable energy, solar panels, wind, et cetera. And if we can do that, we'll have solved climate change. Now, I'm all for that. Okay, don't get me wrong, I'm in favor of those uh, renewable sources of energy. But let's say, just imagine we pull that off, and in, I don't know, three decades, we find ourselves with limitless, cheap, clean, quote, energy. What will we do? We've got free energy, and it's, it's not only financially free, it's guilt-free. Well... Unless we change our culture, we might well end up building more roads to drive our electric cars on, producing more stuff, and continuing our consumptive ways, only faster, because the energy is cheaper and less expensive. 
the energy, and, and also, uh, you know, uh, guilt-free. So, um, so, you know, were we to think about climate change in that single, with that single dimension of clean energy, we might not solve other environmental issues. We wouldn't solve other environmental issues. So we have to think more holistically. What does that mean? What other things need to happen at the same time? All right, so let's, let's uh, talk about these, uh, these three dimensions. So the first, uh, the, and again, as I said, these are interconnected facets of this idea of talking like a mountain. So different sides of the same thing. So the first is what I call ecologically inclusive language. Now, this is obviously a reference to how we've developed an understanding of inclusive language within the human community. We've tried to eliminate terms that reflect biases regarding gender, race, sexual identity or orientation, ethnicity, et cetera, from our communication. Everybody knows that. What we haven't done is eliminate our linguistic biases towards other species and aspects of nature. And here, I'm focusing on English and focusing mostly on specific words. So those biases uh, come in several forms, and one of them is language that characterizes nature simply as a resource for human use, referencing back to what I said about resourcism earlier. And I call this, surprise, surprise, resourcist language. So examples of this would include the ubiquitous term, natural resources. When we refer to aspects of the planet, we most often refer to them as natural resources. Um, it could also include, include things like fish stocks or wildlife inventory or uh, a term that's popular now called ecosystem services, which refers to how, uh, how ecologists and economists try to measure the economic value of an ecosystem to the human community. But again, it's human-centered and it constructs that ecosystem simply as a resource. Um, there are many other examples, I'm not going to go into them. Now, living beings that are characterized as resources soon start to be seen only as resources. And this implicitly denies, I think, all the other facets of their existence. And it encourages a malnourished utilitarian worldview. Um, to use words that presume resourcism is to subtly reinforce its way of seeing nature and of acting. And as communication scholars, you know the relationship between thought and communication. Now, another familiar way that language degrades nature through the use of facets of it to is through the use of facets of it to metaphorically characterize human concepts, behaviors, or personalities. And I call these nature pejoratives. So nature pejoratives include animal insults, which is a concept that anthropologists have understood for a while. Um, for example, phrases such as, <coughs> excuse me, he's a snake in the grass, or he's as greedy as a pig, or he wormed his way in. These imply negative traits about those particular animals because they're being used as metaphors to negatively characterize the human behavior. Another kind of nature pejorative is wildness insults. These are negative uses of generic terms such as wild or beast or animal even. The word, the word wild is often used as an expression to suggest uncivilized behavior. When someone's acting wild, they are out of control, dangerous, violent, or unpredictable. While the word's original denotative meaning is that which is not domesticated, in such contexts, its meaning and connotations make it a derogatory term. And this is a term that can be used in a number of ways, of course. Those, that's not the only way those terms get used, but they can be used in, a way, in ways that reflect a bias against non-domesticated beings. Finally, I want to mention speciesist language. Um, this, since speciesism describes an attitude that sees humans as the best among species, it's a kind of a subcategory of anthropocentrism, it follows that language uh, that reflects the idea that humans are superior to other species and to other animals and plants, this would be considered speciesist. So such language is illustrated not only by animal insults and maybe by wildness insults, but also in other ways. So for example, uh, very simply, uh, we often refer to other other uh, animals as its. It did this, it did that. We don't refer to them as him or her. So we, we, we uh, turn them into objects, essentially, um, with that very, very simple pronoun use. Um, another is hierarchical language, uh, meaning words that suggest an up-down hierarchy in nature. 
This is an image of humans as up and other nature as down. The phrase is power over nature, subhuman species, lesser creatures, uh, the lower orders of creation, and lower animals are all examples of this. So depreciatory labeling occurs when different and connotatively inferior terms are used to label the activities of non-human species. And again, this is another variation on this. Um, so we, we might talk about humans as we eat and we make love. Now, we f refer to other animals as feeding and mating, right? Or reproducing. So those are, again, just a few examples of how our language kind of is biased against other species. Um, and I think we need to question it. And, and, and as I said, it's a conversation that's really barely just begun. And for a lot of people, it's like, get out of here. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so there you go. Um, I think one of the other challenges we face around language as environmental communication uh, people is the absence of words uh, to effectively label and characterize the things we're talking about. And that could be everything from conditions to solutions. Um, one of the examples that gets discussed and, and researched quite a bit is global warming, the greenhouse effect, climate change, which are more or less synonymous terms for that, that, um, that um, process, if you will. Um, some people have proposed that those are uh, not effective, they're not emotional enough, they're not evocative, they're not accurate cognitively, et cetera. And so people have proposed others like climate disruption or climate chaos or even climate weirding um, to try and better capture uh, the spirit of that. Uh, I don't know if any of those are better or not, but it's just to illustrate that our existing words, maybe they aren't degrading nature necessarily, but they're not terribly effective in other ways. Now we can coin new words uh, to describe our experiences and um, that too is a bit tricky, of course, creating new words. The Australian uh, Glenn Albrecht, um, he coined a term uh, solastasia to describe a form of mental and existential distress caused by environmental change, environmental damage. And that term is actually catching on a bit. I'm sure none of you have ever heard of it, but um, in the environmental community, it's, it's catching on. Um, so we need to get rid of some words, we need to, to use existing words better, and we need to find new words to help us support a culture of sustainability. Oh, and by the way, the word sustainability, it's highly contested. It's an essentially contested concept. There are over 100 definitions, and, um, but it's a nice big tent that people can get in because it sounds good. Everybody's for sustainability. Okay, the second facet that I want to talk to now is a uh, question of values. And here I'm interested in which kinds of values are invoked in environmental communication and what the consequences are of, of using those values or invoking them. And the basic framework for this discussion is uh, the values map published by the UK group called Common Cause. Uh, you'll find them at valuesandframes.org. Um, but it's based on uh, the work by Shalom Schwartz and his international team of colleagues on uh, personal and cultural values. Um, they've surveyed over 60,000 people from 60 different countries in the Schwartz Value Survey, um, and their goal was to map common values across cultures um, that act as guiding principles for people's lives. And so this is the map. Um, now the location on the map of any given value illustrates the likelihood that the values near to it on the map will be held with the same intensity by someone. So for example, if you strongly value wealth down there uh, in, in the um, lower left, if you strongly value the wealth uh, in, in your life, you're m much more likely to strongly value authority as well and unlikely to value equality, which is in the upper right, far away on the map. So as principles that guide the choices that we make in life, our values provide us with reasons and motivations for those choices. They give us an orientation to the world and guidance on how to behave. They influence our attitudes and so forth. And to quote from one of Common Cause's publications, our values have been shown to influence our political persuasions, our willingness to participate in political action, our career choices, our ecological footprints, the amount of resources we use and for what purpose, and our feelings of personal well-being. Now the key distinction here in these value clusters that's important for environmental affairs 
is, well, as, for, as well as for other social issues, is the distinction between compassionate values, also known as intrinsic values, and self-interest values, also known as extrinsic values. So compassionate in the upper right, self-interest in the lower left. Now, compassionate values are those in the universalism, universalism and benevolent clusters, um, and they relate to our concern for things outside of one's narrow self-interest, concern for other people and for nature, for example. You could say they are, they are our civic values. Um, as the folks at Common Cause say, these values are strongly associated with behaviors that benefit the environment and society. Self-interest values are those in the power and achievement clusters. They relate directly to self-interest and personal economic reward. You could say that they are our consumer values. And this is what Common Cause has to say about these values. When held strongly, these values are likely to make people more self-interested and reduce their willingness to act on behalf of the environment and others. These are values associated with material reward or validation from, each, from others. And so these two sets of values are kind of in conflict or tension with each other in our minds. It's not to say they can't coexist. Uh, in fact, they do in, in all of us. We, we have greater or lesser degrees of these different values. Um, but they are, as I said, in tension and they can create cognitive dissonance. So one more thing to understand about this is that in the words of the folks at Common Cause, values are like muscles. They, if they're exercised, they strengthen and grow stronger. If neglected, they weaken. So invoking certain values, such as through our work, we will strengthen them and the values around them. The environment we work in will play a big part of this. So if you work in, a, in an environment that privileges self-interest values, such as in the financial sector, then you're likely to strengthen those uh, values in yourself, for example. And in turn, you're likely to weaken your compassionate values. They did a nice set of kind of playing cards with all the different values on them. So all of this discussion of values leads us to start thinking about what kinds of values are invoked and evoked in our environmental communication. And this happens in large part through the language and frames we use in that communication. So historically, most environmental communication has tried to appeal to people's self-interest values in order to convince them of the rightness of an action or choice. So encouraging energy conservation, for example, by telling people to turn down uh, the thermostat because it will save them money, that reinforces power values. Or similarly, trying to scare people into acting to protect the environment reinforces security values. So many of the debates about environmental issues are about financial costs and benefits of different courses of action. And so these appeals to benefits and costs to personal security or to social status um, these have seemed logical and they've been widespread and widely used. Um, but this is partly because we've been operating under the assumption that self-interest values or even selfishness in various forms is what drives human behavior. It's a kind of an assumption about our human nature. Um, and it's the root assumption of capitalism, of course. Um, but that assumption that we have to appeal to self-interest values in order to get people to do the right thing um, Though it runs deep, deep in life, it shouldn't necessarily run deep through our uh, communication because really we didn't, up until recently, have a lot of research on that and whether that worked well or not. But now finally, there's actually a growing body of social science research that's showing us that this approach is not necessarily the most effective way to reach people. And this new research suggests that people are more effectively motivated by appeals to compassionate values. Furthermore, placing an emphasis on self-interest values runs completely counter to what we're trying to achieve in the long run, which is to get people to be more concerned about environmental issues and, and social justice and so forth, so we can live in a, a decent world. To quote the Common Cause Handbook again, uh, using self-interest values simply reinforces the very values that underpin unhelpful attitudes, policies, behaviors, and institutions. So we're working at cross purposes with ourselves by using them. Now instead we need to think about how we can invoke compassionate values such as equality, wisdom, responsibility, spirituality, and so forth in order to support environmental protection and social justice in the short term, but also encouraging that long-term shift towards 
compassionate values and sustainability. And this is, you know, as is obvious, no small task. Um, but it's the focus of the work of this group Common Cause and others increasingly. And the more people learn about this research and understand what the, the way values operate in, in our communication around environmental affairs and other issues and, and shift their campaigning, then it'll become more mainstream. The final uh, interconnected facet of talking like a mountain that I want to discuss is stories. Now, humans have been telling stories for as long as we've been communicating. It seems to be our innate way of relating to the world and making meaning out of the world. Stories, of course, are all around us. I don't need to tell you that. Um, everything from comic books and novels to movies to you know, news reporting stories, nonfiction, policy documents, etc. But we even have narrative even functions at the level of identity, individual identity, collective identity, countries, nations, et cetera, and worldviews. So stories are, are, are ubiquitous. Um, Walter Fisher, the communication theorist, has argued that humans are storytelling animals um, and that effective communication, quote, has more to do with telling a compelling story than it does with piling up evidence or constructing a tight argument. From this perspective, we're immersed in stories and we make sense of the world through stories. They are memorable and relatable in the way that facts and information are not. Okay, so now when it comes to environmental affairs, I want to talk about a couple of uh, stories, a couple, about stories on a couple of levels. Um, the first is the level of the sort of overarching story we tell ourselves about who humans are, where we've come from, and where we're going. And in the most general sense, Western industrial culture tends to tell a story of humans as the chosen ones who were destined to rule over the earth and to exploit its resources for their own ends. The assumption behind this is that evolution is directed and that we are the end point. In this story, we are progressing from uncivilized to civilized. We are using our great brains and opposable thumbs to advance our technology and thus further our progress. Now, the story's a little fuzzy on where it's all leading, but it seems to be into outer space at this point. And such master narratives are basically about humanity, or at least certain parts of us, as divinely endowed uh, conquerors of the earth. It's not all humanity, as you know, um, because some of us regard ourselves as superior to others. Um, not me, I'm saying that, you know. Um, so... That's not exactly the kind of story that's going to help us on the path to an ecologically sustainable and just future. So we're going to have to work on that one, that overarching story. We're also going to have to work on the day-to-day -day stories we tell about environmental issues and their solutions. And what are those? Well, environmental advocates have tended to tell one particular kind of story with variations on a theme. And that story is tragedy. I'm sure you'll be familiar with this if you know anything about environmental issues. The basic story of much environmental discourse is that humans have overexploited the planet, poisoned the air, water, and land, destroyed the habitat of other creatures, and basically really messed things up. So sometimes it's a story of loss, sometimes it's a story of contamination, sometimes it's a story of apocalypse and the end of the world. Now, a lot of well-meaning people believe that fear is the best motivator and getting people uh, best motivator and getting people to change their ways on environmental issues will happen if we can just scare them enough. But in fact, this doesn't really work very well because our brains have evolved to only respond to threats that are imminent, not threats that are distant in space and time. And the downside of so many gloom and doom bad news stories is that they can lead to fatalism, despair and inaction. People can come to feel like nothing can be done and that it's so depressing to think about it that it's just easier to check out and go back to whatever distractions uh, you prefer. So the story of climate disruption is really the clearest example of this effect. Now to turn things around, we need to move away from the overarching story of progress and conquest and the everyday stories of tragedy, loss, contamination, and apocalypse. Stories, of course, are vital to engaging with people's feelings, 
with their values and their sense of morality above all. They speak to our hearts more than our minds. So it's worthwhile to think about how we can create new stories that focus on aspects of environmental affairs wherein people can see themselves as heroes rather than victims or villains. And the Norwegian psychologist perhaps in Stokness says, quote, we should tell new stories of the dream, not the nightmares. We must describe where we want to go, such as happier lives and better cities. Talking specifically about the climate disruption issue, he suggests four types of stories that he thinks we need to start telling. These are smarter green growth opportunities, better quality of life and happier lives in a low carbon world, the ethical care of nature rather than its domination and control, and the rewilding and resilience of nature. And it's my view that we also need to shift to stories of redemption at both the macro and the micro level. We need to understand ourselves as having made some big mistakes, but that we are now wisely, having learned from those mistakes, acknowledging them, and we're working towards making things right. We need more stories of the great things that people are doing in their communities to make them better. To me, what's interesting about framing these as redemption stories is that redemption requires the hero to have a moral awakening so that they understand that what they did was wrong, that they were on the wrong side of history, as it were, but now that they've, but they understand that now and they've changed. Now, there's a caveat, though, about redemption stories, and, and uh, especially in the, envir in the environmental context, um, because we often have redemption stories that um, focus on personal sacrifice. I'm sure you've all heard these. Giving up the harmful aspects of our lifestyle, driving SUVs, eating meat, flying on airplanes, um, will help us solve the climate, the climate crisis, we're told. Um, but there are at least two major weaknesses with that kind. You know, so we, you can redeem yourself by becoming a vegetarian. Um, but there's two, you know, two weaknesses with, with, with that, uh, that version of the, sac the redemptive sacrifice. The first and most obvious is that it immediately presents environmental action as something negative that will result in a diminished quality of life. Obviously, that's not very motivating for a lot of people. And the second is that it frames the solution to our environmental issues as a matter of personal action. It tells us that we will fix things with changes in personal behavior that we initiate individually. So it, it, it places the responsibility on us as individuals. Now it's true that changes in personal behavior can make a difference, just like voting can, but people tend to think that changes they undertake individually will not make much of a difference. Now this can again, can lead to defeatism or simply passivity. Equally important is the concern that framing the solution as personal can often leave out the um, the really important understanding that we need collective action. We need governments, companies, and other organizations to change more than we need to initiate changes ourselves. That we need them both, but that's equally important. But that individual framing distracts from that. Individual changes are nice, but they're not sufficient. So there you have it, three facets of communication that can help us make that transition to cultures that support sustainability otherwise known as talking like a mountain. And before I finish, I just want to point out that this is really all about representing the future, another uh, line from the title of the talk. And that has a double meaning for me. The first is how we depict or portray the future. What pictures of the world to come do we paint through our communication? Is it the gloomy, devastated, and ultimately doomed future conjured up by too many well-meaning environmentalists hoping to scare us into action? Or will it be a future we can look forward to and feel motivated to work towards? It seems to me that that kind of representation of the future would help us to build up our hope instead of our despair. And the second meaning of representing the future is to stand up, speak out, and act for something. It's up to all of us to do this for ourselves, for other human beings living now, for future generations, for other species, and for nature as a whole. It's our moral responsibility. Thank you for listening. So I believe we have time for some questions. Not much, but maybe a couple. 
There's a microphone somewhere. Anybody? Are there any questions? I have a question. Sure. <laughs> Since yeah. I'm holding the mic. Uh, <laughs> first of all, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. I was wondering, particularly thinking about changing the narrative, where do you think that starts? Uh, are these like global climate experts, these are the stories they should be telling when they go on the news, or these things that we should be talking about in our classrooms? Like, where do we start to see some of these narratives happening? Yeah, this narrative I've, change? you know, I, I've, I've said in other places that environmentalists are addicted, addicted to apocalyptic narratives. And, and um, you know, and that's not been, you know, it's not been effective, and it's not been good for where we're at. But I think, I think they have to start everywhere. I mean, I think we have to start focusing on all the good things that are happening, I mean, we, we can solve this crisis. We just are lacking political will in some ways. Um, there's, everything we need is already there, and we need to focus on that, whether you're talking with your friends or working for an organization or whatever. So on all levels, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Over here. Thank you. Um, I'm Suda Ishida from Hamlin University. I've been teaching environmental conflicts for such a long time, yeah. actually. And I was an environmental journalist from Thailand. All right. So all of these things kind of a lot. In fact, when we talk about issues dealing with environmental conflicts, it probably started way beyond what we've seen today. However, these days, What's flying around us is the green buzzwords. Everything organic, everything natural, and then the language, the narrative has been taken over by the corporates as well yeah. and different groups. So how are we going to go beyond the green buzzwords? Even you yeah. mentioned the term moving to renewable energy, and yeah. no one is talking about the safety of the electric vehicles or right. the batteries and right. the mining. How much can we be optimistic about that? Because yeah. we're not mentioning the hyper-consumption that actually is the real cause of the problems. Yeah, no, you're right. It has, to some extent, the discourse has been hijacked on one side by corporations and those green buzzwords and the green washing, if any of you have heard of that term, of painting your company as environmentally friendly, uh, when it isn't really <laughs> necessarily, maybe because of some small thing that, that you did. And yeah, I think that's another real uh, issue with the, the whole discourse around it. Um, we need to hold these companies accountable for what they're claiming, for one thing. I think uh, we need to be much more, we need to think much more critically about all those buzzwords and things that are being used. And yeah, as I said, it's not, you know, it's not enough yet, but we understand that that's part of the the package of what we need to do. Good question, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much for your patience and for coming. Feel, feel free to get in touch with me if you, if you, if you like. <laughs>